Sean Eli is with me today. I am so excited you are here, Sean. Um, you are, we are live. You're in New York. I'm in Michigan. And you um, probably get this a lot. Are you feeling What's funny with today? your face? Are you feeling funny today? <laughs> uh, yeah, but it's, it's weird, though, that people laugh less early in the day. Oh, okay. I well, don't Sean, know why that is. I love this. The Ivy League of Comedy, because you didn't start out in the world of comedy. Tell no. us a little, tell me a little bit about yourself, because I, I did my research, but welcome to my Facebook Live, and I love your background. Thanks. It's, it's a standard grow up in New York, go to college, get a job background. I was working in finance and I was there for about 15 years, making lots of money for other people. And yeah. I went, went on a date with somebody. I've been writing jokes for Jay Leno's Tonight Show monologue freelance. I, and the way that started was when he first got the Tonight Show full time, took over for Johnny Carson. Um, I would read the newspaper in the morning on the train to work and think of something funny. And then he'd be telling essentially the same joke that night. So I called and said, hey, can I write for you? And they I spoke to somebody there who asked some questions and gave me a fax number and I started faxing in jokes. And then I was on it, but still working in finance. I have to stop you. Was that his sort of the way he did things? Like he would just take jokes from people or did he have a group of people that he sort of entrusted? He had a full time. He actually had the largest writing staff in television. Okay. He had something like yeah, 18 or 20 full-time writers, but he still occasionally used something freelance. If something, he, he would be blind to the jokes that came in. He would just get submissions and go through them and pick the ones he liked best. Okay. And the people, of course, who are professional writers who did nothing but write jokes eight hours a day were much more likely to get their jokes on air, but occasionally he used something from a freelancer. Okay. Interesting. And, yeah, so I was doing that and I went on a date with somebody who's, who I guess I mentioned it, and she said, you know, you should take a stand-up comedy class. Well, she said, you should be a stand-up comedian. I said, I don't want to perform. And she said, well, I took a comedy class, and I think you should do the same thing. And I watched her class perform and thought, they're funnier than I expected. And so I signed up for the class and started performing. And about five or six years later, I said, you know, I have two jobs, and I should get rid of one. And I got rid of the high-paying one in favor of the fun one. <laughs> so I just told you before we went on that my daughter is, um, you know, that struggling actress or, you know, so as a parent, <laughs> when you hear that and you get rid of the high paying job, you're, you, you sort of go, okay, live the dream. <laughs> well, the difference between stand up comedy and acting is actors pretty much have to have jobs like waiting tables where they can get off during the day to go to auditions. Right. Stand up comedy is at night. There's no during the day. Right. You can have a day job for a while. Right. Which which is good. Um, I you know the the comedy um, that I've always I personally most enjoy is the comedy that you do, which is just the observation of life, and um, and it's. I think it's, you can't teach that. It is the observation of the things that go on around you. And, and then you share your observation. And I'm always so in awe. I, I, I have a son who has that sort of quick wit. And I'm, I'm in awe of that. And it's one of those things I'm always like, oh, I wish I had that, you know? And I just don't think you can teach it. I think you have it. I think, yeah. Well, I, in terms of observational comedy, I don't do all observational. A lot of my stuff is storytelling, just stuff that's happened to me. But I think it's, you got to look at life sideways. And well, you have a and I do view mean that, that, you, that you, but you look at the things that happen around you and you, you find, what is funny about it or that there's there's truth in it that is sort of comedy to it the, the you know there's there's things about it that just are 
humorous. Well, I guess, I mean, one of the jokes I've been telling lately is I, I say, you know, I'm, I'm having, I'll, I guess I'll tell most of the joke. I say, you know, I'm happy to be here. I'm having a good hair day. And then people look at this and sort of giggle. They don't know if it's a punchline. They say, well, you don't know me. This is as good as it gets. <laughs> and I say, I tried a new shampoo. It promised extra thick body. Unfortunately, I spilled it on my stomach. <laughs> and I guess that joke comes from reading a shampoo label that said extra thick body. And I'm like, I don't want an extra thick body. And it there just, you go. That's where it comes from. Yeah. But I mean, I, you know, to me, I think like who thinks like that? You do. Somebody is used to taking things out of context, I guess. Did you always sort of, I mean, as a kid, I mean, I think like you went into finance, which to me is very linear. It's just, you know, numbers and, and, you know, very straightforward. I mean, as a, as a child or as a teenager, did you have an observation like that of the world? I or like writing, this? you know, I, I wasn't the class clown. I thought of funny things and was always probably too scared to say them in a situation where I get yelled mm -hmm. at for being funny like in school. But I would write things down that I thought were funny. So I guess I always saw things sideways, but I think most kids are funny. You, know, you look at kids playing, they're laughing all the time. Yeah. What, um, from the transition to finance to the world that you know in your career now, um, what's been the 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 best part of it for you? Well, let me put it this way: we're recording this at eleven a.m. New York time. Um, I woke up around nine thirty. I, I knew I'd be up by eleven, so I didn't have to set an alarm clock. I use my alarm clock when I have a flight to catch. That's about it. Mm -hmm. I used to need. I used to get eight hours of sleep and wake up and say, oh, I guess I got to go to work. And now I get by with about seven hours of sleep and um, I wake up and say, oh, I get to go to work. I mean, I have the best job in the world when I can do it, which is making people laugh for a living. So tell me about that with a pandemic going on and, and you know, we all experience the pandemic in our careers differently um in the entertainment world it's been horrible i mean we all want to be together we all want to be in a club we want to laugh you know how i mean i can guess how it's hit you but what are you doing and how are you handling this you know it's world? worse for it's worse for actors because as a comedian i work i mean i may be in a show with other comedians but we're on stage one at a time so mm -hmm. i just need me so in that regard, and same for musicians, you know, they have to be together pretty much. So it's, it's easier for stand-up comic to do something. But here's, here's the thing we discovered. I'd say the secret to comedy is 100 people in a room that holds seven. You really, you need laughter to echo. It's not just that the comedians need to hear laughter for our timing. The audience needs to hear other people laughing to make them comfortable. Mm -hmm. That's why you don't want to be the one person in a room laughing. That, that makes you feel uncomfortable. That's why they put laugh tracks in TV shows so that the people at home hear other people laughing. So they're comfortable laughing out loud. And so outdoor shows have just been traditionally hated by stand-up comedians. And yet uh, the outdoor shows I've done in the past year were, and a real outdoor show, people spread out. It's not, right. you know, a hundred people on blankets in a park right next to each other. It's people literally in cars or sitting at tables six or 10 feet apart they've done re really well. And the reason we've done really well is because people have really just needed entertainment. Yeah. But Zoom shows are tougher because the audience generally doesn't hear a lot of laughter. And I, when we first, when comedians first started doing shows on Zoom, it was really tough. And some of us have figured out how to use the medium and it's different. You've, we've just got to pause and give people a chance to laugh. And even if they don't, they're not inclined to laugh out loud. The pause gives people sort of the, the freedom or the invitation to laugh, and it makes it much easier for everybody. Oh, I like that. I, and I that that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, the truth of the matter is we need to be laughing. <laughs> you know? People, yeah. I mean, I mean, I've done outdoor shows on my block. We started having weekly happy hours during the pandemic or a couple of months into the pandemic when it was mm -hmm. warm. And my neighbors would say, well, why don't you perform for us? And I said, you know, outdoor shows are terrible and I don't really want to do this. Mm -hmm. And then I, after about two months, I realized 
I'd written all these new jokes and they were just sitting in a file on my computer and I wasn't trying them out because we don't know what works. We may think we have the funniest joke in the world and we get in front of an audience who just dies. Mm -hmm. And conversely, sometimes we think of something as just a setup to a joke and people laugh at it. So it works both right. ways, but we don't know what people are going to laugh at until we try it. And I thought this is a perfect opportunity to get an idea of what works. And I just went out there at a happy hour because they're bugging me about it. Went out there with a piece of paper and read jokes off the paper and they did really well. And I'm like, oh, these are good jokes. So then I started doing five minutes at the beginning of our weekly happy hours. I love that. I, like I said, I think people need to be laughing right now and, and, and having, you know, that somewhat normalcy. Um, what um, are you writing for other people or do you usually just write for yourself? I mean, I write early... for my, I, now, yeah, I used to write for Jay Leno for his monologue and mm -hmm. that's gone. So I write for myself. Occasionally comedians will say, hey, I have another tag, another punchline for a joke you're working on. Mm -hmm. So we help each other out. But pretty much unless you're at the level of, you know, Chris Rock coming out with a new HBO special every year, comedians write their own jokes. Yeah. So a question for you, if, um, you know, someone goes to Wharton Business School like you <laughs> and then says, I, you know, I'm done with that and I want to go into being a, a stand up comedian, what advice do you have for them? Um, well, do you want the comedy advice or the business advice? Well, I'll take both. OK, well, the comedy advice they're going to get from every comedian, which is the only way you get better stage time, stage time, stage time is like location, mm -hmm. location, location in real estate. You've just got to go up on stage and it's going to be miserable. You're going to fail. You think you're funny. Your jokes aren't that good and you're not that good at telling them. And it takes a while. And you'll, I've seen, you know, I've, I have a friend who's a friend who's working now to become a comedian. She's been doing it for just a few months. And I'd forgotten what it's like to start out where most people start out very stiff they're not very animated because they're under so much pressure to just remember their jokes that they don't have the energy that they need to tell right them. it's sort of like get let me get the joke out and then the stage presence they forget it, all the other components of actually probably being on a stage right so i mean the, the standard advice is just get on stage get on stage get on stage at an open mic night or any place you can talk to to have an audience Okay. And then when you write out your jokes, you want as many punchlines as possible in the shortest amount of time. You don't want to have a punchline every two minutes. So write out your jokes, circle everything people laugh at, and see what extraneous words or sentences you, you really don't need. Because a lot of times new comics, they'll have 45 seconds to get to a joke, and half of that 45 seconds is not necessary. Interesting. I love, so I love, I, I love, I feel like I'm, you know, getting beyond the tips and I'm going back to, I'm, get, we're going back to school here. I love this. All right. Okay. I'll give you one more. Um, the punch part of the punchline has to be the end of the sentence, because if they get the joke in the middle of the sentence, that's the punchline, because that's where you've given away the surprise. And then you keep talking. You're doing what's known as stepping on your punchline. People are going to start laughing and they're going to stop laughing because you're still talking. Oh, I, and I have noticed that I've noticed that before where you're laughing in the middle and then it keeps going. Right. And, and then it's like dead. Right. The surprise has to be the last couple of words. Okay. And okay. almost always you can rewrite a joke to, to make the sentence structure so that the joke is at the end. I have a couple that are really hard to do that with. And then you, you I stare at them and say, how am I going to fix this? Mm hmm and it's tough sometimes, but it's almost always doable. And the, and the business side of you says what? Um, you know, I started a little later in life, so there is there is wisdom that comes with age because I see 20 year old comedians burn a lot of bridges. They think they're funny, they're mean to people, they act like they know it all, and it gets around. Because when you're new, most of the breaks you get don't come from club owners or theater bookers. It comes from other comics. They say, hey, I want to introduce you to this guy or come along and I'll let you do five minutes of my show. And if you're a jackass, that doesn't happen. I was auditioning at a club a bunch of years ago. I'd never been there before. I walk in, I introduce myself. The guy says, can I get you a drink? And I say, you know, just, just a club soda. He was a bartender. Just a club soda, please. And he 
gives me a club soda and I throw a couple of bucks on the bar because you should always tip. Mm -hmm. And and then I went to the to audition. It turns out the bartender called in sick that day and this guy owned the club. Oh. So what if I'd just been a, a jerk to the bartender right. figuring out he's the bartender? It, it's interesting that you say that. And, um, and I really appreciate that advice because often in my own um, PR world, I get asked by younger people, how do you get it? You know, what's great advice if you're getting into doing PR and what's, you know, what's the key? What, and I, I say, just be nice. There's no, there's, you know, I could give you public relations advice, but just be nice. And I think that you just said it because you don't know who you're talking to all the time. And the key, I think the key to the kingdom is being nice to people. It well, opens doors. It really makes a difference. I've said to people on occasion, new comics, like, you're not funny enough to be an asshole. Yeah. Like, if you're... Chris Rock, I'm not saying Chris Rock's mean to people. I don't know the guy and I've never heard anything mean about him. But if you're Chris Rock now, you can be an asshole to people. But starting out, he might not have gotten to where he is had he been mean at the beginning. And you know what's nice is my guess is he's not. Because often people who do very well, just they're not, you know, or you hope they're not. I you think know. that, you know, there's mean people. I mean, people I think there's people. assholes out there for sure. <laughs> there's mean people in every business, but right. I think it's a lot easier to be mean and become a CEO than to be mean and become a comedian. Because I've met a lot of management in companies where the boss is a jerk. But, and I think that might even be a quality that helps people become the boss. But in stand up comedy, you're everything. You're the mm -hmm. performer, you're the writer, you're the stage manager. A lot of times you're the lighting and video and audio person. You're the wardrobe person. Sure. You are, you have to be a self-starter. I am also the web designer and the search engine optimization expert. Not that I am, but in my company and the PR person. And because there's not a lot of money and the booking agent, I do all of that because there's just not enough money to pay people to do all those things. When you have a bad performance, what do you do to, speaking of all those titles and all those things that you have to do? Oh, and the well, psychologist. Yes, you have to then be your own cheerleader. What do you tell yourself? Well, that is, that's another example of the wisdom of starting a little later. If you're 20 years old and you have a bad show, you're miserable for a week. That's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. If you're 40 and you have a bad show, you say, okay, I have another show on Thursday um, or whenever, you know, I'm going to do a better job on that show. And what went wrong? What did I do wrong? Mm -hmm. I had a joke I'd been telling for about a year and it was a, a not even, a, it wasn't about an ex-girlfriend so much as it had an ex-girlfriend reference in it. And it usually did really well. And one time at a theater, it didn't get any reaction. And I'm like, it's not like there was three people and they didn't like it. There are 150 people in the audience and got nothing what did i do wrong and i videotape almost all of my shows and here's another piece of advice for, for newcomers record your shows everybody tells you that the hard part is not recording your shows the hard part is then watching yeah because just like you don't like hearing your voice recorded it's terrible to watch your own shows but i watched the video and i realized as i told that joke i sounded angry mm -hmm. and it made me look like i was angry and mean to the ex-girlfriend when I told the joke about her. And now when I tell that joke, I have to remind myself, you have to be smiling when you tell the joke so that you don't sound angry. And it hasn't been a problem since. But I think the thing is, if you have a bad show, what can you learn from it? And if it just was a bad show, forget about it. Everybody has a bad day at work once in a while. Sure. The, 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 I think the challenge is when you have a bad day at work, you often don't do it in front of 150 people yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> that, and, you know, with lights on you. But um, I love the great advice. I love this conversation. You can um, find out more about you and booking you and hopefully being in a, um, a some room. 
<laughs> some kind of room. I was going to yeah. say theater, outdoor space. I don't, you know, to me, I don't care where we are, you know, soon at Brain Champion, uh, Champagne. Champagne. Brain oh, champagne. Brain champagne. I look down at it. Brainchampagne.com. I mean, come on. That in itself is a great website. Um, and um, there's a lot of great um, information on your website. There's clips of your shows. There's, I mean, I, I had a lot of fun going Thanks. through your you website. Know, there's, I have a lot of jokes on my website. I have 50,000, my last count. 50,000 words worth of jokes on my website. It was great. I, yeah, to give you an idea how much content that is, an average novel is about 100,000 words. So that's a lot to wow. read. You could spend an entire day just reading jokes on my website. I love it. I love it. So I appreciate your time and popping in and coming in from New York um, via Zoom. <laughs> well, actually, I'm, I'm in the room behind you. I said I was. Well, yeah, I know. You're just here. over there. Thanks for flying into Detroit today. I appreciate it. Hopefully I'll be in New York soon and I'll look you up and see where you are and we'll have some fun laughing in, in, in person. Thanks. Or, you know, I can come to Michigan. People pay, I, I fly. We, Not we, now, but eventually. We would love it. We have some great places here and God knows our governor was on today saying she's opening up some more some more places. We are all in need of laughing and being together. So. I agree. Thank you. It's great See to you talk soon. to you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.